I am Dennis Slater. I am an avid researcher for Canadian comics, and you're listening to the True North Country Comics podcast. Welcome to the True North Country Comics podcast, dedicated to promote Canadian comic book creators and supporters. It's April 2nd, 2021. I'm John Swinimer. If you want to drop me a line, you can contact me at john at truenorthcountrycomics.com. On this episode, I chat with Dennis Slater about the impact of Canadian comics from the prairies. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts, and it's also available on the True North Country Comics channel on YouTube. I invite you to like and subscribe. Dennis is a jazz journalist for our arts and entertainment magazines, museum curator at the Glenbow Museum in Calgary, and was curator for an exhibit that dealt with censorship in Canada in the 1950s. That led to his interest in comic books during the World Wars. My most recent chat with Dennis in 2018 focused on Canadian comic books during the First and Second World Wars. For this interview, to celebrate the 80th anniversary of the Canadian Whites, based on the March 1941 publication of Better Comics Volume 1, we focused efforts on the Canadian white comic book creators from the Canadian prairies. And to take advantage of Dennis's love of jazz, as an extra bonus, we chat about Scott Chandler's Bix. And so, without further ado, here's my chat with Dennis Slater about the impact of Canadian comics from the prairies. Well, Dennis Slater, thank you very much for taking time to chat with me. Oh, you're most welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate your time. Well, normally to start off the interview is ask about the first comic book that you read. So I'm wondering if you remember, do you remember what that might have been? Uh, it would have been a Batman comic. I would have been eight years old. When I grew up in small town Manitoba, I was so enthralled with the story of Batman that I started what I was calling the Batman Club with oh. only select members in it. So mm -hmm. some of my friends back home will still remember that, I'm sure. <laughs> That's that's a fun thing for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So for those not familiar, we chatted a few years back about Canadian comic books in the First and Second World Wars. So what I wanted to do is, before we get started, if you wouldn't mind just talking a bit about your background in this particular oh, subject matter for those not familiar with you. Oh, I uh, have a museum and an archives background, but I also have a longstanding interest in comic books and goes back many, many, many years reading them, spending many hours on Saturdays at some of my friends' places and my own just going through stacks. If you can imagine a stack of comic books about four feet high, <laughs> that's how you while away the hours on a Saturday afternoon. I have uh, a deep interest that has led me down some research pathways to the point where I was teaching a course at the University of Calgary a number of years back on comic books and popular culture. I've done a series of lectures over the last five or six years for the Calgary Public Library lecture series on Canadian comics on the whites, as uh, you and I are discussing this evening. Also did a few lectures for Calgary Historic Calgary Week for the Chinook Historical Society, again on the same subject. So it's something that particularly interests me. It interests me because it's Canadian content. It is, interests me because there isn't a lot of information out there. So I consider that to be a challenge. Let's go out there and get some more information on it. Yeah, certainly a lot of background there. And, and one of the contexts we're talking about is the, the anniversary of the Whites that are celebrating 80 years uh, in March, which is great. Yes, uh, exactly. 1941, uh, Better Comics Volume 1, Number 1 came out. So that, that's tremendous. Someone who has that copy around must uh, must have value. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. So I wanted to get based on your research, what you what you found out about Canadian comic book creators from the prairies. I'll, I'll tell you what what I've done is first of all sort of setting parameters for myself in terms of how I approached the research and how it unfolds into what I consider to be three threads. So for example, if we're talking about the prairies. I set my parameters as being, we're talking about Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And before I continue much farther into this conversation, I just want to acknowledge in doing the research and doing background reading, a huge, huge debt to the likes of Ivan Kosmarak. I hope I'm saying his name correctly. Also, library and archive publications that have come out over the decades, 
and Invaders from the North, John Bell's uh, mm-hmm. indispensable book on the subject, Canadian Encyclopedia source materials, and just a lot of reading and research of materials that are alive and well on the web. And what I came up with, three threads in talking about prairie creators. And when we're talking about creators, to my mind, we're talking about the people who actually crafted and created certain characters that appeared in the whites. And it's interesting to reflect on that because that influence that was set at ground zero back during that time of the Second World War has set the bar and and set the threshold for the development of Canadian comic book experts and contributors extending all the way up to today. But I'll talk a bit about more about that in a few minutes. But the three threads that I followed were this is looking first at, if we're talking about Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, looking at the people who were born in the West, who became pivotal at the time of the Whites, talking about people who were based in the West, and following exactly that same logic, who became pivotal in the development, creation, and promotion of certain characters for the Whites. And then lastly is an idea that I picked up on because I was quite intrigued by one of the statements in one of uh, the many research papers that Ivan Kozmark has written and promoted online, and that was the Canadianness of the Canadian comics. So in looking at that, I started to look at characters and situations that are set in the prairies set in the West. So with that in mind, this is what I started to find. And this goes back to, at least with birth dates for some of these characters, uh, goes back to the 19th century, late 19th century. So for example, Charles Thorson, and I'll get into a bit more detail in a minute or three. So Charles Thorson was born in Winnipeg. James Simpkins was born in Winnipeg. Peter Cush was born in Winnipeg. George Freeman was born in Selkirk. Walter Tremblay was born in Jasper, Alberta. Todd McFarlane, who you mentioned a few Mm -hmm. minutes ago, was born in Calgary. Adrian Kleinbergen was born in Edmonton. Brian Gable was born in Saskatoon. So what we see is an interesting nesting of individuals who have been important in the creation of the whites and people who became pivotal in the way that comic books developed and comic book characters and heroes developed. So, for example, looking at those who were prairie-based, George Freeman, for example, was based in Winnipeg when he worked with Cumley to create Captain Canuck. Who was, right. He was also one of the founders for, as far as I can determine, a short-lived company in Winnipeg that was established in 1991 that was called Digital Chameleon. And Richard Cumley was based in Winnipeg when he worked with Freeman to create Captain Canuck. Now, an interesting thing that I've come across is that John Stables, for example, and so we're talking about Brock Windsor here, uh, the character of Brock Windsor. He was born in England in 1912, but he moved to Winnipeg when he was 13 years old. So he lived in Winnipeg for a few years. I'm still trying to suss out exactly how long that period was, but I know that he eventually moved to Victoria in 1939. Uh, Then there's Jean-Claude St. Aubin, who was based in Winnipeg, who also worked with Cumley, Freeman, and Leishman to create Captain Canuck. And then I should should also indicate here that one of the things that I've come across is that in terms of people who contributed to the Whites, it overlaps into people who were working in the field of political cartooning. So Mm -hmm. those who had that kind of expertise, those who had that kind of training, sometimes morphed into job opportunities working for the whites. And Avram Yanovsky was born in Ukraine in 1911, and he moved to Winnipeg in 1913. He did political cartoons. He also created and worked on the character of Major Domo for joke comics. In Saskatchewan, Archie Dale who I'll talk about a bit more in a minute or three. He wasn't born in Saskatchewan, but he homesteaded in the Touchwood Hills in Saskatchewan. And as far as Alberta is concerned, uh, Richard Comley, who I mentioned a few minutes ago, by 1979, he had created CKR Productions in Calgary in order to continue to publish Captain Canuck. And Mel Crawford was born in Toronto in 1925, but he lived in Drumheller as a boy. Now, that to me is interesting. It's a connection. Did it affect 
his work? I don't know. I can't speak to that. I'm not finding those connections yet. And John Byrne was born in England in 1950, and he moved to Edmonton in 1954. So Charles Thorson, who I mentioned a few minutes ago, was born in 1890 in Winnipeg, and he was one of a group of illustrators who worked on the original iterations of Bugs Bunny. Right, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and he drew cartoons in, for the Winnipeg Free Press and the Grain Growers Guide. Now, this is the interesting thing about the Grain Growers Guide because that shows up at least three times as a place where young cartoonists, artists, political cartoonists could cut their teeth back in around 1914 and in through the 20s. He was also chief illustrator for Eaton's Catalog. And he worked for the Disney studio in the 1930s. And he worked for the Fleischer Brothers. So that's kind of an interesting connection. James Simpkins, who some people may or may not know, created Jasper the Bear. Right. So if you're familiar with Jasper, Alberta, Mm -hmm. there is the statue. It's been many years since I've been to Jasper, but the statue is there. He was inducted into the Cartoonist Hall of Fame in May of 2016. And Jasper the Bear cartoon strip ran in McLean's magazine from 1948 right through till 1972. Now, something that I noticed that's, I think it's a significant connection. And that is that Simpkins studied at the Winnipeg School of Art under Lemoyne Fitzgerald. And Lemoyne Fitzgerald, as far as I know, is the only member of the group of seven who was born and based in Western Canada. Oh, wow. He was in Winnipeg. So Simpkin was one of the earliest artists who was hired by the National Film Board. Jasper the Bear is his character. And it was cartoon strip. It was, uh, well, is the statue in Jasper. Mm -hmm. Archie Dale was born in Scotland, and he came to Canada when he was 17. He's the one who homesteaded in the Touchwood Hills. And he did editorial cartoons for the Winnipeg Free Press. And again, here's another reference to the Grain Grower's Guide in 1907. He moved to Chicago in 1928 and created a comic strip, and I just love the name of the comic strip, called The Doodads. Oh, okay. But he returned to work for the Winnipeg Free Press in 1927. Hmm. So these are people who were born in the prairies who became very important in uh, in the careers of illustrators. The training that they had uh, was also important. So uh, And Peter Kutch, born in Winnipeg in 1917, and he was head of the art department for the Winnipeg Free Press. When Archie Dale retired in 1954, Kutch became the editorial cartoonist and the art director for the Winnipeg Free Press. Mm -hmm. So the connections are multiple here. And George Freeman was born in 51 in Selkirk, and he's one of the contributing creators for Captain Canuck. And again, as I mentioned, he co-founded Digital Chameleon in 1991. And that business closed in 2003. I don't know whether any of the people who were part of the founding group went on to create other businesses or not. Ron Leishman worked in Winnipeg when he was working with Cumley on the creation of the Captain Canuck character. And after 1975, the Captain Canuck project was driven by Cumley Freeman and Jean-Claude St. Alban, who I mentioned a few minutes ago. And St. Alban was born in Matheson, Ontario, but he started studied art in Montreal. Right. Lived and worked in Winnipeg in 1970s. And um, he eventually moved to Calgary, which is kind of interesting when you think about it, because mm-hmm. uh, I know that in some cases, these people who were involved with the Whites uh, went on to teaching careers as art teachers in high schools. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's kind of cool. And then Richard Comley was born in Oxford, England, but he worked in Winnipeg when he was part of that group uh, and driving that group to create Captain Canuck. So, and then Captain Canuck winds up on a stamp in 1995 and a Time magazine cover in 1997. In some of your research, it sounds like the editorial cartoonist and and you said the grain growers publication yeah. had a great influence, or at least was a sort of a the the breeding ground, I guess you could say. For yeah, a lot I of think it artists. was a training ground for uh, developing that skill set for a number of these people. 
and then then of course when the call came out for uh, the need for Canadian comic books, these people were ready and raring to go. Yeah, absolutely. Just one more that I want to throw in there is John Stables, who was the creator for Brock Windsor. Mm -hmm. Something that I find quite fascinating about that is that, first of all, in the Brock Windsor biography, if you will, that uh, Brock Windsor basically crashes his canoe on this mysterious island in the Lake of the Woods. Uh, He is a physician and adventurer based in Winnipeg, if I recall. I'll have to double check that. But not only was Stables living in Winnipeg for a while in creating Brock Windsor, he was also, as part of the backstory for that character, he was including that Western Canadian setting of uh, Winnipeg and environs and the Lake of the Woods. So, Yeah, I was going to ask you if the environment played any part in the creation of these particular comic books. Well, you know, I really wonder about that because one of the things... And again, I'm just, I was inspired by one of the articles that Ivan Kozmark had written, and he was talking about how Canadian were the Canadian comic books. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about settings and I started thinking about characters. Well, what is it about a character that identifies that individual as being Canadian? Well, Frankly, most of the time with our superheroes and things of that nature, with the exception of Nirvana, most of those characters were not necessarily obviously based in Canada or having adventures in Canada. And so that's something that takes a bit more digging. I have found in the case of Brock Windsor, because my guess is this, because Stables moved from England and then was in Winnipeg for a while. He set the character of Brock Windsor as a physician and adventurer from Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. Something else that's interesting, which I found completely by accident, is that uh, Vic Griffin, also known in comic book circles as Frederick Griffin, wrote a story for Active Comics, and it was called The Cockney Ranchero. And that's about ranch life in Western Canada. Interestingly, it's specifically about, I'm assuming that this is an imaginary location, but it was specifically about a ranch called the Circle X Ranch in Alberta. So it begs the larger question, do you set your stories so that they're identifiable as, so the locations are identifiable for your readership? I noticed, for example, that in 1933, in the Men of the Mounted comic strip that was running in the Toronto Evening Telegram, that they specifically said, and this was from newspaper ads at the time saying, you should read this comic strip. It said, relentless manhunts starting in the Canadian West, extending to the farthest points of the compass. So they are identifying the Canadian West. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would think, I mean, I'm just speculating here that they would want to write comic books for people who would uh, identify uh, uh, the surroundings, you know, and the stories and the adventure that would come out of living in the West. Yeah, and I also noticed, for example, that Elizabeth McDougall's character, which was a story that was featured in Educational Projects comics, that that specific adventure was in Pigeon Lake, Alberta, in the wintertime. So, to my mind, it would take a very deep reading of available comics from the time to tease out whether those storylines are actually actively identifying specific places. Because so much of the action during the Second World War, so much of the action was for people who were pilots or who were in the RAF or people who had superpowers. And they were fighting for the Allies and assisting the Allies during the course of the Second World War. So the adventure, the actual action of the adventure wasn't necessarily taking place in Canada. So the backstory on the characters, were they in fact Canadian characters or was it Canadian comics that were featuring action and adventure in far off locales that weren't necessarily any more Canadian than the fact that they were in Canadian comics. And that's Ah. a worthwhile question, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's interesting stuff, that's for sure. So we're here talking about the 80th anniversary of the Whites, and it started uh, back in March 1941. And so with all that being said, 
what is your personal opinion about this? Does this matter? Is it something that we're we're missing out on that we just neglected that we need to focus on? Or what are your thoughts on it? It's something that we missed out on. I would argue that given how difficult it is to acquire copies of some of these comics, that really and truly this was a pivotal time. And yes, these were the circumstances where the border was closed to American comics and it was a business opportunity for Canadian comic book companies. But it's also true that this was a time period where people who had skills, as they would say in jazz circles, for people who had the chops to be illustrators, to create stories, to carry a story through from beginning to end in a a number of issues of a given comic, this was the opportunity for them to cut their teeth. And it's been said, and I've read a number of times, that because of the training opportunities, because of those opportunities with the whites, the skills that were developed by a number of the individuals who I've mentioned over the last few minutes actually put them in good stead should they have chosen if they chose to go down to the united states because something that you encounter often is well you know they were the canadian whites and so we did it and they weren't great and really how does that compare to the american ones and i think that that's hugely a misnomer because there were some very very skilled people in that circle they could have competed and gotten jobs anywhere they wanted to. It just so happens that we were lucky enough that they were here to create those stories for us. They cut their teeth on those, and that's the legacy that they've left us. And and I would argue that, that many of the people who we now acknowledge as people who have been pivotal in comic books, since, say, the 1960s, the 1950s, that next wave of comic book creators, illustrators, that it was because of those first steps that were taken by the whites back in the 40s. Well said. Very good. So on a different note, uh, you you just mentioned uh, jazz, and you mentioned you're a jazz journalist. So I wanted to ask you uh, if you had a chance to read Bix that uh, Scott Chandler created uh, last year. Yes, I did. And And what were your thoughts about that? thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I think it's very, very interesting to uh, to look at that time period from the 20s, in particular the 20s, because that was a pivotal time for jazz. Those people who were experimenting, many of those names, and, and you see there's a parallel here because many of the names that were household names for people who were jazz fans back in the 20s, many of those names have been lost. Mm-hmm. And without efforts like this on Bex then again, we'd be talking about a moment in history, in this case, in musical history, that's been lost. And you, what do you think? It wasn't until someone actually pointed out that it reads like a, a music uh, score. Yeah. Uh, and that th- there is a pivotal moment in the middle of the book where, where you have this sort of dialogue, and then it, it sort of, it's sort of like a, a rise and then a fall. Yeah, you could have in a, in a big, you know, orchestra, for example, or a big high note, and then it sort of sweeps away, and and the action sort of slows down a bit. So I thought that was quite interesting. I, I had not noticed that until someone pointed that out to me. Well, it's interesting too because I just finished reading a book by uh, John Leland, and John Leland now writes for the New York Times. But it seems to me when I first came across his work a number of years ago. Uh, He was writing for Rolling Stone, and one of his most recent books is called Why Kerouac Matters. Mm. And one of the things that he talks about is he he talks about how important jazz was in Jack Kerouac's thinking and that jazz is often very open-ended. And and so you have an idea, you fly with that idea – and then are we looking for something that has beginning, middle, and end? No, we're looking for something that takes you to the threshold of the next idea. And so it could go beyond that into another creation, another recording, uh, another inspiration for the other band members. And I think, too, that the nature of improvisation is something that becomes so important when we're talking about these people, and particularly old, the earlier people like Bex in that the formula, insofar as it's a formula for jazz, is something that's in the past was referred to as ABA, 
And that means that at the beginning, and you're probably familiar with this, I'm sure, but at the beginning, you state musically what it is that you want to talk about. And then in the middle, you improvise on what you've stated about what you want to talk about. And then at the end, and so if you imagine something like a track from John Coltrane, for example, or Charlie Parker, you have those first few introductory notes, and then you improvise on that. And then at the end of that particular creation, then you bring your listeners back to what it was you said you were going to talk about. And it becomes a journey. And so it's a musical journey, but it's also a journey of ideas. Yeah, I remember talking to Scott about that. He he, he uh, did it all by hand, and he said yeah. he he reflected that it probably wasn't the wisest idea because he picked up on that jazz theme. He took that same idea that you had about refreshing or going back to the same ideas throughout the creation of the big story and yeah. the book. And yeah. had he done it digitally, he would have been able to just cut and paste. But instead, <laughs> he had to do it all by hand. So it was well, just you, you, meticulous. And, you know, the thing is, is there's something to be said for that because we get used to being able to cut and paste. Mm -hmm. And when we cut and paste, because of the beauty of computers, then sometimes some of the ideas that we may want to revisit, those are gone because we cut and pasted. Mm -hmm. And if it's there and it's written, yes, it's more laborious, but it also gives you more of an opportunity for reflection, I think, because maybe there was a germ of an idea that you would have discarded if it was just straight ahead, cut and paste, but a germ of an idea that you thought, well, maybe that could be an interesting thread to pursue later. Yes, that's a tremendous amount of work. It's oh, yeah. exhausting. <laughs> but it, it really turned out well, I tell you. Yes, I agree completely. Yeah, good stuff. Well, Dennis, those are all the questions I have for you, but I'm wondering if there's something I didn't ask that you'd like to get across in this interview. I think, you see, I see it as historic legacy. I see this as a thread from the whites through to the things that we now explore with comic book storylines and characters. So, for example, John Byrne created Shaman, and who is a member of Alpha Flight, both of which are Canadian-based hero groups. Well, Shaman is a member of Alpha Flight, but Alpha Flight is a hero group. So, too, is Omega Flight. And one of the interesting things about Shaman is in looking at connections, and if we're talking about prairie connections and whether, as you and I have discussed, whether it's about the creators or whether it's about the subject matter, something that's very interesting about the Shaman character that was created by John Byrne is that the real identity of that hero is Michael Two Youngman, who is a First Nations individual, according to the backstory a First Nations individual from Calgary. If you look at the backstory from Omega Flight, and this is interesting because, you know, in looking back at, at the Whites, and I said earlier, there wasn't necessarily a storyline or an indicator that your action of the story was occurring in Western Canada. But if you look at more recent things, so for example, in a 2007 issue of Marvel Comics, for Omega Flight, there is an origin bomb that they have to investigate. And I'm a prairie boy, so, so this really tweaked my interest when I came across it. The origin bomb is located in Regina. Now, in thinking about that, do we necessarily think of Western Canadian locations as being the center of activity for a story, whether back in the days of the Whites? or currently. And also, you look at things like Chester Brown's Louis Riel, and you have graphic novels where the entire graphic novel is, is based on, on a Western Canadian historic figure. And I think that that, I think the groundwork was laid for paying attention to what we have to say about our part of the world. And the people who were working for the whites who were creating those characters, they did that. And I would argue that without them having done that, many of the characters and character settings that we have now that we've come to assume to be commonplace in Canadian-based comic heroes or Canadian-based comic groups wouldn't be with us now. Thanks to Dennis for the chat. 
You can discover more about the Chinook Country Historical Society at ChinookCountry.org and on Twitter at C-H-I-N-O-O-K-C-H-S. And you can discover more about the history of Canadian comics in the current issue of Sequential Magazine at gumroad.com slash L slash S-E-Q-M-0-8. And thanks to you for listening to the True North Country Comics Podcast. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to and like this podcast on Apple Podcasts. And please leave a good rating. Also check out the truenorthcountrycomics.com website and follow along on Twitter at True North Comics. True North Country Comics is now on YouTube. Please like and subscribe to that video channel. Please send your feedback to John at truenorthcountrycomics.com. Thanks again for listening, and come back soon for another episode. Bye for now. Truth Country Comics podcast is copyright Truth Country Comics, copyright 2021.